My name is John Passfield, and the title of this reading will be L. M. Montgomery, Video 13, The Planning Notebook. So here is my novel, L. M. Montgomery, I Gave You Life, a novel by John Passfield. But I'm not going to read from the novel. Uh, instead, I'll read from the planning notebook, which I wrote while working my way through the writing process for the novel. So, let me hold up the manuscript of the planning notebook. Here it is. It's held together with elastics. This is the only physical copy. It's on my website, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, the cover is fuzzy. It's like a ship coming out of the fog. You can't really see what you have when you start planning a novel. Gradually, it becomes more and more clear, and eventually uh, the photo on the cover of the novel is what you get. But at this stage, everything's fuzzy, everything's murky, everything's foggy. So that's the planning notebook in, in manuscript. It's 77,000 words long, and it was written over a span of 15 months. It's available for free on my website, johnpassfield.ca. So I'm going to read five passages from the planning notebook. I've reprinted them because if I take the elastics off, it'll start falling apart. So here's the first passage that I've chosen from the planning notebook. It just occurred to me that L.M. Montgomery is a female and I'm a male. This has been irrelevant so far in the planning and will continue to be irrelevant throughout the writing of this developing novel. It is my contention that, two points here, I'll number them. Number one, gender, race, age, nationality, and any other categories of birth, experience, or belief are the information of our lives, which we turn into the imagery of our lives, but that, number two, we human beings all process imagery in the same ways and for the same purposes, to assess where we've been, in brackets, what we have thought about, what we have done, and what has happened to us, and a bracket, in order to be better able to take the next step in our personal or societal journeys, in brackets, to make better decisions, or to react more positively to what we cannot control, and a bracket. So all humans process imagery the same way, male or female, or whatever other differences there might be among humans. Hamlet and Ophelia have different information to turn into imagery, which they must process, with male-female being only one among many differences. But when Shakespeare shows both characters as being without power and without knowledge, their task as human beings becomes the same, male or female, to turn the pertinent information of their lives and the lives of those around them into the imagery of their lives and to process and assess that imagery as best they can under the circumstances. Literature now seems to dwell on what separates us in brackets, gender, race, age, nationality, surface experience, etc., end of bracket, much of it worthy of interest, but I prefer to dwell on the level of mental response to the challenge of living, which is our lot as human beings and which is common to us all. That L. M. Montgomery is female and that I am male will be irrelevant in this novel. That she will turn her own personal information into imagery Information and imagery that I do not share will not prevent this developing novel from being an objective correlative, that's a phrase by T.S. Eliot, an image pattern, a personal myth of the processing and evaluation of the information and imagery of my own life as I have lived and thought about it. So I'm using the details of her life, she happens to be female, to express the method by which I and every other human being process of information into imagery, which we then assist, assess and which we then act on. All humans think the same ways. Number two, the second passage I've selected from the planning notebook. I'm always amazed that a novel of mine has to be puzzled into being. 
I always come from a complete rough draft, which has just been polished word by word. Novels about Glenn Gould and Emily Bronte, for instance, to a massive image quarry. That image quarry? The biographies, novels, and journals of L.M. Montgomery and have to work out the concepts that the image quarry suggests to me and puzzle out how these images and these concepts will be presented in a proposed, proposed novel. So you go from a finished novel which you're polishing to something that is going to be a novel, maybe, but it's just really a mass of information. What am I going to do with all this information? How do I make a novel out of this? At this point, the proposed novel almost seems too complex in terms of the plethora of contributing ideas to be written. I don't think I can write this novel. There's just too much to get control of. Part of the problem, the puzzle to be solved, is the attitude of the main character, Ellen Montgomery. For my recent main characters, and I'm going to hold up four books that I had completed, and I knew their characters and how they thought, okay? So Lord and Lady Macbeth, in this novel, Lord and Lady Macbeth, Full of Scorpions is my mind, okay? I knew how they thought. I knew their attitude toward all the information of their lives. My dad, Cyril Passfield, 1932, he went out west, and I wrote a novel about it. I knew how he thought about the information of his life. Glenn Gould, Light and Dark, a novel by John Passfield. I knew how Glenn Gould thought about the information of his life. And also, I'd worked on this novel, Emily Bronte, more than myself than I. So, here's the point I'm going to make then. For my recent main characters, I didn't think that I could write a false image. Though I always polished the wording of the images later. <clears throat> but I knew what they would be thinking when they thought of this information. This will be true of this main character, Ellen Montgomery, but it isn't quite true yet. So, at the time I wrote that, line. I had all that information and I didn't know what she thought about all that information. I didn't know what the words of her thinking would be. So that's the point there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Number three. Here's the third passage that I took from the planning notebook. It's important for me to keep in mind that the biography slash personal life image units are a mental construct by the mind of the main character Ellen Montgomery and not a chronological real-time account by a narrator. The biography slash personal life image arc in the mind might well be a memory from a later time, as might also be the writing of Anne of Ingleside image arc. So going to see a particular movie, such as one about Mary Queen of Scots perhaps, and writing an Anne of Ingleside chapter in the same chapter of my novel does not mean that the two were experienced at exactly the same time. My whole novel might be taking place as an image pattern in her mind on Ellen Montgomery's deathbed in 1942. Though the novel will not say that or even indicate that, there will not be any indications as to whether the 50,000 word image pattern is being created in the present moment, which is 1938, on which the mind of Ellen Montgomery is focusing whether it's being created as a focused present moment memory at a later time. Now, she died in 1942, so every word of a novel could have been thought in 1938. There's nothing that comes from later in terms of information, but it could have been thought in 1939, 1940, and so on, right to the moment when she's dying. She could have had a 50,000-word thought about 1938 and everything that led to it, in 1942. That's the point there. So it's important for me to remember that because I'm working with imagery and, and moving it around. So am I going to move it around strictly by day, month, year? Or am I going to move it around for the import it might have when one image is placed beside another? I had to keep that in mind. How is this novel being put together? Okay. Number four, the fourth section that I've taken from the planning notebook. So... Is L.M. Montgomery a deep thinker? Is she an Einstein? A Beethoven? A Glenn Gould? Well, okay, here's, I think, nine dashes, but I'm going to number them, okay? So I'll read out the numbers. Let me get my page set here for when I turn the page. Okay, so is she a deep thinker? Is she as deep a thinker as Einstein, Beethoven, or Glenn Gould? Well, number one. 
I believe that we humans all think in the same way, right? You and I think in the same way as Gould, Beethoven, and Einstein. It's nothing to do with whether we're as smart as they are. It's the process we follow. Number two, we all have multiple layers of circumstances. Number three, we take in the experiences of others as we understand it. That could be history, society, religion, friendship, family, news of the day, decade, century, and lifetime. We take in all this information and reduce it to fragments. Four, we all think in all levels and from the basis fragments to the crudest images to the most conscious thought. We take the fragments, turn them into less crude fragments, eventually a sentence, a paragraph, and so on. Five, we all form image patterns below the level of conscious thought in our subconscious minds my proof is that every human dreams in visual stories, which might be shallow in meaning or might be complex. Six, so too, I believe, the mind thinks in subliminal imagery while we are awake and conscious of other things. So we know we dream when we're asleep because we wake up and see the dream. We also dream, meaning think, when we're awake, but we never know unless it comes up from the subconscious to the conscious. More about that in a moment. Seven, dreams fade on awakening and we remember little bits. We are told that we dream all night and are never aware of the content of most of our dreams. Eight, the greatest of our thinkers, and this is where Einstein, Shakespeare, Beethoven are different than you and I. The greatest of our thinkers are those who are able to make conscious because concrete image patterns, which the rest of us can have access to, these are image patterns of the deepest level of human thought as found in the minds of exceptional humans. What do we know, uh, how do we know about the image patterns in the deepest level of the mind of these people? A Beethoven symphony, an Einstein theory, a Shakespeare play, these are all concrete physical items that we can see that came from deep in the mind of these creative people. Now, number nine, the question as to whether Shakespeare was able to think about and analyze his plays on a conscious level is interesting but ultimately irrelevant. That his subconscious mind created complex image patterns in response to the life that he led and the life that he saw and was able to create concrete image patterns in words and actions that we as fellow creatures can see in here, is the point. We can see his plays. We can read his plays. He was intelligent at the deep creative level and might or might not have been intelligent at the prose everyday level of his existence. We'll never know. Okay, apply that to Ellen Montgomery. Was she highly intelligent at the conscious level? Was she highly intelligent at the subconscious level? Well, my book, my novel, attempts to uh, explore that question. Okay, here's the fifth section that I took out of the planning notebook to read today. This will no doubt be the most densely imaged novel which I have written. That there might be less awareness connection between and among the various imagery creating and imagery pattern levels of Ellen Montgomery's multi-consciousness mind means that the text of the novel is being presented as taking place at a deeper, less focused, less formed, less cohering level of image contemplation. It might mean that this novel shows one or two steps before the creation of a mental objective correlative, a phrase of T.S. Eliot's, personal image pattern, personal myth. This is the first time that I have thought this about a main character of mine. Glenn Gould and Emily Bronte, two of my characters in my novels, are both KG in their image presentation of self to self. But no matter what the complexity and privacy, one level of the mind insisting on privacy from another level or levels of the mind, I felt that the text of their novels were their fully formed objective relatives. I've always assumed that the changes in the imagery of the TV screen or computer screen of our minds always produces a sense of complete and accurate thought. 
though complex and enigmatic to the outsider, the reader. However, here's a new phenomenon, new to me, that number one, the text of a novel of mine might present a pre-objective crowd of a pre-personal image pattern, a pre-personal myth, with either A, a unified objective crowd of personal image pattern, personal myth, at some later time in the unprinted after novel, or B, might not do so, but will simply keep producing attempts at forming a unified personal image pattern of belief, or perhaps better of, flip the page here, personal significance. So does L.M. Montgomery ever form an image pattern which captures her thoughts, or is she always trying to form an image pattern and never finally coming up with the right image pattern to exemplify what she's thinking? This is the premise which has emerged for me as I work on writing the images of the image mosaic, image mosaic in process, which represents the thoughts of the main character, L. M. Montgomery. What a fascinating development, and this is my 24th novel, so if you write 24 novels, you get ideas that you wouldn't have gotten with your 14th or your 4th novel. Okay, no, those are the five passages that I've taken from a planning notebook. Here's a note that I wrote after reading this over. There's a lot here to think about, of course, but what caught my eye as I read this over in preparation for this presentation was the second passage that I read. In that passage, I say that I'm almost amazed at the challenge of starting the writing process for a new novel or novella. At one point in my note making, I labeled this phenomenon creation shock. One comes from the very enjoyable process of polishing the complete rough draft of a novel or a novella in which every decision has been made and every word is in place. All one has to do at that stage is to find better words in order to better realize the original conception of the novel or novella as an idea. It's a shock to go from that stage to the stage in which one is taking what might be a sentence. I'm going to give you an example here. A young 17-year-old poet commits suicide. Just a sentence and begins to puzzle out how in the world one can expand that idea, that thought hyphen emotion, into a 50,000 word novel or a 20,000 word novella. So creation shock, you look at the sentence, a young 17 year old poet commits suicide, how am I going to turn that into 20,000 words? How am I going to turn that into 50,000 words? A novella or a novel? Well, okay, here's a planning notebook which is not quite complete, but which is nearly complete because I almost have the rough draft of a new novella. So here it is. It doesn't even have a cover. This is a planning notebook. Planning Chatterton, a self of my own, okay? That's a notebook in process. The process whereby I went from a line, a single sentence idea, a young 17-year-old poet commits suicide, to a 23,000 plus novella has taken me 64,000 words of note making so far. So that big fat notebook I just held up is uh, 64,000 words and I'll have a few more hundred because I'm almost finished by the time I am finished. Now, here is the novella, Chattering in a Self of My Own, not quite complete and not yet polished. So this will be about 23,000 words and uh, it is not quite finished, but it will be soon. So I started with a single line. A 17-year-old poet commits suicide. I went through, what did I say, 64,000 words of planning, and I ended up with 23,000 words of novella. So creation shock, but you push ahead anyway and get it done. This is near the end of December 2023, as I'm making this presentation. I will spend the month of January of next year, 2024, polishing the novella and writing a journal of response to that writing process. Then I will come back and add a paragraph or two to the planning notebook, and then I'll begin another writing process for another novella and undergo once again the phenomenon of creation shock. How in the world am I going to turn this into a book, okay? So once again, then, this is my 
novel. I've got a lot of things to hold up here. Ellen Montgomery I Gave You Life. And it can be found on Amazon if you're interested. It can be found at my publisher's website, rocksmillspress.com. And uh, those two books, uh, or the one book I've talked about, The Planning Notebook, and another book, uh, my journal, uh, both in response to this writing process, uh, are available on my website, johnpassville.ca. So lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.